This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Natural Grower. Launched in 2019, their award winning liquid fertilizer and plant feed and soil conditioner is made entirely from maize. Naturally rich in nitrogen, potash, phosphate and other trace elements that plants and vegetables love, it's approved by the Soil Association, Vegan Society and Organic Farmers and Growers. Their concentrated natural fertiliser can be poured around the base of plants, whilst the plant feed and soil conditioner can be mixed into the soil or compost and used as a mulch on the surface as a long-term slow-release fertiliser. The fertiliser can be used for all outdoor and indoor plants. As a special offer for listeners, Natural Grower are offering 15% off all their range. Simply go to naturalgrower.co.uk and enter Roots15 on checkout. So this week, I'm speaking to Benedict Van Heems, gardener, author, editor and face of the popular growveg.com YouTube channel. If you're thinking about growing veg this year, whether you're an old hand or new to it, you're bound to hear something of value from Benedict, whose innovative approach to growing food takes the hard work out of things. I began by asking Benedict to talk about what growveg.com is about. Uh, yes, of course. Um, growveg.com is uh, just a general resource, really, for growing all of your own food and some flowers as well, organically and naturally in step with nature. So um, it's a really good resource, actually. We've got over, I think it's sort of something like 1,500 uh, separate articles now um, on everything from how to sow seeds to companion planting. It's a really good resource. There's articles and there are all of our videos up there as well. So you can pillage it all. It's all free. And uh, and that's where you'll find our garden planner, which is the, the one item we do sell. And that's uh, software to help you lay out and plan your, your sort of kitchen garden. And the book kind of evolved off the back of the website? Yeah, that's right. So um, the website and our videos uh, and the garden planner is all our sort of bread and butter. And as we're, <clears throat> as we're online, we've got more and more of a following and you know a lot of people sort of reading our articles and watching our videos every month so we decided to put out a book and uh, it's our very first foray into publishing and as a company and I'm I've written it and some members of the team have helped photograph it and grow out some of the projects so it's a real team effort and uh, we're very pleased with it it's been very well received so far so temporarily sold out in the UK just for a couple of days so it's uh it's obviously been something people are quite warmly receiving mm, that's fantastic i mean i think by the time this interview goes out you should be all back in stock hopefully yes hopefully that's right they are shipping some over as a matter of priority so uh it's it's an annoying problem but it's sort of in a way a good problem to have definitely <laughs> yeah um so when i was reading the book i i thought well, you know i i do mm. grow edibles but i know it's not right for everyone or is it I mean, I'm kind of, you know, putting my spin mm. on it. Um, so is growing edibles right for everyone? And the second part of that question really is, mm. do you think it's worth it? Do you think it's worth doing? Yes, of course. Um, so I would honestly, I, I mean, you'd expect me to say this, wouldn't you? But I would say it is suitable for everyone. I mean, obviously, if you absolutely loathe it, then there's no point doing it. But the thing is, anyone can grow any, you know, grow something. So that means if you're in a flat with no garden or even balcony access, you can do sprouts, uh, you know, sprouting seeds on the windowsill and fresh herbs um, and mushrooms, things like that. And if you've got a small garden, you can, you know, have a few raised beds or just crops in pots. The advantage to growing your food, I would say, isn't necessarily money saving. It's more about getting in touch with nature, feeling the seasons, if you like getting dirt under your fingernails. It's been um, scientifically shown, actually, that the, the sort of bacteria in the soil generally, genuinely make you feel good. It lifts your mood and spirit. So I think that daily contact uh, with growing something is is really therapeutic. It's like mindfulness almost. So I'd say, yes, it actually is, is for everyone. Um, and it definitely is worth it from a, a freshness and uh, that sort of in tune with nature kind of aspect. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, veg growing isn't without its problems and challenges. Um, so I'm going to ask you some practical questions. And my first one is that you mentioned in the book about um, mm. starting seeds off in the open ground. Um, and I wondered how mm. you managed to do that without losing them to slugs or rabbits or birds or, <coughs> or cats, you know, or all of the above. Mm. How do you do it? Yeah, quite. I mean, it, it helps if you wait until it's an appropriate time to sow. So at the moment, um, I would say, we're in early March. It's it's kind of wet, rainy and wet currently. Um, <clears throat> so it's probably not suitable for sowing outside yet, but maybe in another couple of weeks, it's gonna you're going to be good to go. So sow when it's appropriate, and then the seedlings are going to be more, they're going to be out of the ground quicker, and they're going to be more resilient, and they're going to grow quicker. But obviously, um, things are going to get attacked, and, and all of those pests and nuisances you've mentioned are quite common. Uh, with slugs, it's simply a question of um, laying little kind of beer traps. I sink them down into the ground and they uh, attract the, you pour some beer into it, like a little ramekin, you sink it into the soil, pour beer into it, and the slugs are attracted to the sort of yeasty smell and, and come full to their demise, basically. Things like cats are quite hard. Um, if you've got a smaller garden with a big sort of neighbourhood cat problem, then you you'd simply have to sort of put netting over the ground I think or, or sticks kind of placed so that they can't uh, scratch into it is a good idea so um and, and birds that's that's a very common thing although not really that's as common as, as maybe slugs but uh, again you, you can put netting over plants and over your beds when and if they're a problem sometimes I find for example pigeons uh, can peck at things you know kind of early on in the spring because they're quite hungry and there isn't much natural food so it's just kind of um laying kind of uh, all the protection necessary uh, sometimes you know vegetable gardens can look a bit like a fortress with all the sort of covers and so on but it is a great way of avoiding pests yeah so what should we be doing in our gardens at this time of the year if it's maybe a bit early for seed sowing yeah sure i mean it's kind of getting every all your ducks in a row ready for the new growing season so at the moment I'm <clears throat> I've been a bit lazy. You should do this a bit earlier, but I've been topping off the beds that haven't been covered with compost with uh, comp with garden compost. So digging all that out, laying it down, and then it's got a few weeks to kind of um, <clears throat> get incorporated by the worms and so on. Um, I've been I have been getting on with sowing, but in sort of pots and trays indoors and and also in the greenhouse. So uh, there's there's an awful lot you can sow. And uh, yeah, just kind of like making sure I've got enough bamboo canes and doing a sort of stock take, if you like, so that I don't run short because there's nothing worse than being at a key moment, for example, planting out your tomatoes, going to the garden centre and realising everyone's been doing the same thing and they've sold out, which has uh, happened to me once before. Uh, so it's just kind of um, those kind of getting preparations. Something else actually you could be doing if you're, if you're new to gardening or expanding your patch. Um, is putting in, for example, new new beds, new raised beds for growing. So that's a great project just to set everything up so you're you're ready to go in about two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good advice, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So if people um, do start their seeds off indoors, mm. I think this yeah. is, is quite a common problem. If you start your seeds off indoors and then mm. you can't get them outdoors because it's still too cold. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. What's, well, how can you combat that? What can you do about it? <clears throat> Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, it's ideal if you've got a sort of halfway house. So I germinate a lot of things indoors and it's, it's not so much the warmth, but the sort of steady temperature that helps with germination. Because often things don't germinate if it's sort of quite cool by night and then warm by day. It sort of whipsaws and you, that kind of steady temperature helps with germination. So I've had loads of tomatoes and, uh, you know, obviously it's too early to plant them out. But I've got a greenhouse, so they go in there during the day, and then I quickly run back with them at night if it's quite, you know, cold, and sort of just pop them, in, uh, you know, by the back door indoors. Um, <clears throat> so ideally, it's having a cold frame or greenhouse or some sort of protected structure that you can leave things in their pots or seed trays, uh, you know, during the day and at night as well if it's not too cold. Alternatively, uh, it's a, it's you know it's a little bit of equipment, but grow lights are really helpful. Because sometimes it's not it's not so much the sort of lower temperatures. It can be the poor light levels indoors that are, uh, you know, a real nuisance uh, with, with seedlings. So it's kind of, if, if you haven't got a greenhouse or a cold frame, then grow lights can help you kind of 
eke out the time they're indoors for by another couple of weeks. Mm. Yeah, uh, and I suppose the other option would be maybe just to leave your seed sowing later. Yeah, absolutely. That's always the obvious. Sorry, that's the <laughs> obvious thing, really, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, just leave it a couple of weeks. It's it's so true, actually, what you say there, because sometimes you just leave it two or three weeks, but because it's that much warmer later on in the season, it's worth about one week's delay. That's all. So it kind of um, they catch up pretty quickly. So um, I'm always trying to push the seasons by chancing, chancing things. And if there's a failure, it's no biggie. Then I can sow a bit later. Yeah. Well, I think everyone just gets so excited at this time of the year, they can't wait to get the seeds in. They the do, don't they? That's it. Yeah, <laughs> that sort of garden is itch, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, talking about this year in particular, are you growing anything new and exciting? So um, I've not started it yet, but what I, one thing I'm quite keen to do is ginger. Uh, and that, that's going to involve not necessarily buying ginger from a normal supermarket, but like an Asian uh, grocery, Asian supermarket where they've got sort of uh, it, ginger loose and it's kind of a uh, bigger chunks of it and i'm going to select a sort of bit of rhizome with a bit of uh, shoot on it and then i can plant that up and grow it on and it should do all right in the greenhouse i've seen it growing uh in in places like um the center for alternative technology for example over in wales in their in their polytunnels and uh it, it can grow but um you need a protective environment but i think that's quite exciting because uh i use a lot of ginger and wouldn't it be great to, to have some, you know, some of your own, really? Yeah, it really would. I mean, I've tried mm. with supermarket ginger before and I've never, even when you can see a little green shoot on it, I still can't get it past that stage. So I don't know what oh, really? I'm doing wrong. Um, or, oh, that's going to be, yeah, yeah. Mm, so no, if you do it. I'll have to do my research thoroughly then and uh, make yes. sure I get it right. We'll try to. Well, yeah. I was going to say you could put out a video about it if you could and then I, I might yeah, be able to do absolutely. it. <laughs> okay, we may well do that. Yeah, yeah that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know yeah. people have been growing turmeric as well. That's quite yes, a, that's a right. One. Very similar, isn't it? Mm. Uh, sort of rhizome type thing. Turmeric meant to be amazingly good for you, actually. Well, so it's ginger, but uh, yeah. um, superfood kind of thing, the turmeric is. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so in the book, you talk about upcycling and repurposing household items mm. uh, and turning them into containers for growing. And that was interesting to me. You're doing that you know, in a slightly different way to other people might have done it in the past. Um, mm. And I think you do, you choose some quite unusual items. And I did wonder though, is there anything that people need to be aware of when they're doing that? Because I suppose there's pitfalls depending on what you use. And I'm thinking mm. of things being maybe a bit too free draining or, you know, not protecting the roots enough. Is, you know, mm. what do you look for in a, in a good item that would work as a container? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, Yes, I guess the first thing is to use the the repurposed or recycled item to make sure it sort of matches what you intend to sow or grow in it. So yogurt pots with uh, holes stabbed out at the bottom are absolutely fantastic for for most kind of young plants that you'd sort of prick out into them maybe because they give that little bit of extra size. They're like a sort of super module, if you like. Um, So, yeah, it's matching up. So it's a suitable size and making sure you put drainage, drainage holes in the bottom for everything. Um, I've, I've really recommend, uh, making kind of sewing, little sewing modules from rolled up newspaper and, uh, and also, uh, loo roll tubes as well. <clears throat> the, the thing you've got to watch out for with biodegradable things such as that is that they can, uh, you know, fall apart a bit or unfurl in the case of loo roll uh, tubes. So you want to kind of when you sort of uh, make them is, is pack them together so they're cheek by jowl in a sort of separate in a, in a tray that holds them together if that makes sense so they will otherwise they will kind of potentially fall apart a bit but then they're supporting each other <clears throat> and then when you come to sort of plant them out you just kind of carefully fish it out and uh, if it comes away a bit that's absolutely fine because it's it's planting time um yeah so as far as you know dangers or anything like that i think um if you're making things from paper, then you want to use newspaper because the inks tend to be kind of made more plant based, whereas, you know, magazine, something glossy isn't ideal. So it's just uh, using as natural, uh, you know, materials as possible with that. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much the only warnings. The other thing, actually, a lot of people uh, repurpose old um, wooden pallets that you know that stock comes in and those are absolutely fantastic because they're often available for free or very cheaply and people are trying to get rid of them 
uh, just making sure that the pallet is heat treated. And often there's a stamp on the on the pallet, which has the sort of letters HT, which means heat treated. And if it's something else, then it's best to, to leave it alone. Uh, so, yeah, otherwise, um, it's fair game, really, when it comes to repurposing items. Mm. So heat treated meat just means that the wood would last longer, does it? it yeah. So it, all pallets are treated in some way. Uh, some pallets are sort of impregnated with chemicals, which are potentially uh, dangerous if they leach into the soil that your plants are growing in. And so they're not good for if you then ingest that, it could be harmful. Heat treated is just means it's been treated simply by uh, by heat. I'm not sure of the exact process, but it's a completely benign treatment process. And to be honest with you, almost all pallets nowadays are heat treated. So it's kind of... um. Uh, you know, academic, but it's just, it is just worth checking for that HT palette, you know, palette stamp, like a stamp on the on the uh, on the palette. Well, that's good to know. Um, mm. Also, I was what appealed to me about your book is that you sort of do a lot of hacks, um, and you seem mm. to be a big fan of making life easier, which is always good for gardeners. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I wondered what you thought was the most labour intensive job in the garden, and if there was anything mm. that people could do to make it easier or quicker. Yeah, uh, I guess the biggest thing is digging, digging, isn't it? It's kind of, um, it takes it out of your back and uh, it's actually not very good for the soil. So my number one tip on that thing would be to not dig, which sounds sort of slightly, slightly uh, at odds with all the advice we've been given over the years. But if you're applying regular additions of a mulch over the surface of the soil of, uh, you know, good, well-rotted organic matter like compost or well-rotted manure, at sort of um you know one to two inches deep plus then uh and and you give the worms time to incorporate that then actually you never need to dig so um that would be my number one tip and just also applying mulches generally will uh a save on watering a lot in the summer and b gives uh gives weeds a really tough time i adopted no dig a few years ago as a as my technique and it's kind of um weeds just they pop up but it's just it's never really a big back back breaking chore trying to trying to kind of scrabble out around and sort of fish them all out because uh they're very few and far between so uh ditch the spade is my advice <laughs> yeah and also you mentioned water in there and and i find watering mm. a really time consuming job if you're doing it properly it is, isn't it yeah, yeah absolutely but have you got any thoughts on that is there any ways to speed that up apart from mulching um, obviously yeah mulching but um you know I, yeah, it's a good point, really. Obviously, watering by hand is good with a watering can because you can kind of inspect and water as you go and uh, and be a bit more economical with the water. But if you've got a hose, um, you know, fitted with a you know spray gun thing that has a nice sort of rose rain effect and you can kind of, um, you know, just kind of having that so you're not running back and forth with, uh, with the watering can, that does save time. But I would I would stress that it's you really do have to stick with it and do it manually, uh, you know, as in not leave it alone and put it on an irrigation system because it's it, it, you can be so much more responsive to the plant's needs then. You can skip over things that don't need watering. You can pay attention to plants and like observe them as you're watering things like pests and diseases and, you know, general care to see how they're doing. Um, but, yeah, I just, yeah, I, as you say, water, doing it properly does take time. But watering really, really thoroughly, really deeply once a week rather than shallowly every kind of day or other other days is much better than it's much better, really. So, yeah, be thorough, uh, but less often. Yeah, that's a good tip. Um, and also, as you were saying at the beginning, garden's quite mindful. So maybe you mm. could make it into like a meditative thing that you did at the end yeah, of your work day. Absolutely. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I tend to water. Um, they say, you know, there's a conflicting advice as to when you should water, but I tend to, to do my sort of outside veg patch at the end of the day, you know, in the summer, like it's sort of 8 p.m. It's quiet. The birds are singing. The sort of sun's low in the sky and everything's glowing orange. And it's it's quite a moment, really. It's a, almost spiritual, I'd say. Mm. It's not being too pretentious. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I get you. I do. So obviously people have been gardening i think gardening more during lockdown and mm. people might start kind of trickling back to work now and yeah, yeah. you know they, they might want to keep up with their veg growing ac activities but find they're shorter on time than they were <clears> last <throat> year um you know is there anything people can do to keep things low maintenance from that perspective 
Yeah, um, I mean, we've talked about no dig and about sort of saving time watering and so on. I'd say crop choice is a big one, and, and there's still time to make these choices now. If you're short on time and you just don't want to be kind of out there every evening, uh, you want to sort of plant some kind of what I call, not plant and forget, but almost plant and forget plants, crops that you can plant in the spring and occasional watering and weeding and feeding, but otherwise harvest them um, a bit later. So things like winter squashes are great for this uh, and sweet corn maybe. Uh, they, they kind of are planted in late May and then you just kind of like leave them until uh, almost early October when you're sort of harvest or September, October when you're harvesting them. So that's the kind of, it's a bit of a compromise, isn't it? Because if you want lots of food every day, then you need to put in a bit of time. But uh, if you just want to keep your hand in, that's a good way of those kind of um, fairly low maintenance crops. Uh, potatoes are great, actually. It's another one just for, um, you know, they're not very fussy and they just kind of get on with this and they put on rapid growth, which crowds out the weeds. Um, so those kind of, yeah, low maintenance crops would be the advice. Definitely don't give up because it's such a fantastic thing to have and to do. And just to put something on the table every now and then that's homegrown is just magic. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I was intrigued as well to see that you had a bit in the book about growing mushrooms, which mm, um, yeah, I'm yeah. guessing they're the sort of thing you can just put in a pot and then leave to do their thing. But um, how easy mm. is it? Uh, and, you know, do you get much of a, a harvest from them? Yeah. So, I mean, I used a, a mushroom growing kit, which is usually how you, you do it, um, from a UK-based uh, mushroom seller. And uh, you get the sort of uh, spawn, which is... Um, on like sort of barley uh, barley grains, so inoculated as it were with the spawn of the of the fungus, and it was oyster mushrooms I was growing, which are, are very easy to grow, and then um, some straw pellets which you rehydrate and they kind of um, you know triple in size, and then you fill your pots and you mixed in the spawn with the straw mix, uh, and then it's really very straightforward. It's kind of um, it's just keeping it damp. And they come on so quickly, sort of after two weeks, there's these little clusters in, around the holes that you cut in the pot. And then they just, uh, almost overnight, within two or three days, they're ready to pick. So it's very, very straightforward. But um, I'd say if you're doing it for the first time, do use a kit because it just um, it comes with all the instructions and it's kind of much more of a known game. But you can buy, I've never done it myself, actually, and it's something I'd like to try soon. You can buy the the spawn just to put directly outside onto things like bark chippings and, and sort of have a sort of mushroom bed. And then, uh, you know, it can potentially survive several seasons. Um, but it's a great one. It's a great one for the kids, actually. Uh, my little daughter is seven and she loved kind of um, being involved in it and uh, Still didn't eat them, though. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, she was interested anyway. Well, yeah. it's a start. That's <laughs> good. Yeah, and it's, it was money money saving as well, actually. So um, I got maybe four or five really loaded punnets of, of oyster mushrooms for an investment of sort of six, seven pounds, which uh, I think is definitely cheaper than you can buy them for. Yeah, and they'd be perfectly mm. fresh as well. They would be absolutely perfectly fresh. And, uh, you know, I think everything always tastes better when you're it and it's probably um, just in the mind, but they really did taste absolutely superb, it has to be said. Oh, I'm definitely going to have a go at that. I, I'm, mm. I feel a little bit nervous because I don't trust my abilities with those because I've never done them before, but I'm, I am going to have a go. So um, It's great fun. You should definitely do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I will. Um, and also there was a really good tip in the book, and I hope you don't mind sharing it. Um, no, of course not. No. It was your tip for growing sprouting seeds in an old carton. Oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's probably the fastest thing you can grow um, out of anything. So uh, there's, they're sold as uh, mung bean seeds. They're like dry mung beans in packets. Uh, you can get them in Asian supermarkets, but I think I've seen them for sale in, in supermarkets, uh, general ones as well. And, they're, you know, they're sold for sort of soaking overnight and, um, you know, then boiling up into stews and things. But if you soak them, and then put them in a, a well washed out uh, like juice carton, for example. Then uh, it provides a, a dark, damp environment for them to sprout into growth. And you've got to um, you've got to sort of nick corners into it, and so you can kind of drain it off, uh, and the sort of water comes out of the sort of nicked corners that you've like cut into the tops uh, of the carton. And you rinse them once or twice a day, 
But this kind of dark, costed environment uh, ensures that they grow completely free of light. And then it kind of builds up pressure as they grow. Uh, so bean sprouts, actually, the, the, the reason they're sort of thick and crunchy is, is partly down to pressure. They grow them in, in sort of under pressure and that sort of thickens them up like muscles, I guess. Uh, and yeah, so after about ooh, what five to seven days tops, you can cut open the cut carton. It's a real moment of revelation because you don't know what it's going to be like inside and you peel it back and they're all there ready to enjoy. And, uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful project to do. I, I, I love doing that. And, um, again, it's a great one if you've got kids because it, it doesn't take too long and, uh, they can sort of see the whole process and, and sort of take ownership of it. So yeah, it's a great one. Mm, yeah, that's a really clever idea. I've got uh, horrible memories of a seed sprouter that I bought, and then let, oh yes, and it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let everything go mouldy in it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think the trick is with those things. Actually, uh, what I do is I put them by the kettle so that um, whenever I'm making a hot drink, I always think, and I have several a day. I think, oh, do I need to do it? And you just need to rinse them off in the morning, and then sort of at night before you go to bed, and that way you remember. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. You've got to be diligent. Um, that's it. <laughs> so if anyone's thinking, if they haven't already started and they are thinking about growing a, well, starting a veg garden for the first time this mm. year, what would be your best advice? So um, it's kind of obvious, but I'd always say start small. Uh, don't overdo it and get sort of too intimidated. And the second piece of advice is to grow bulletproof crops. So my the sort of three that I always recommend are courgettes because they're so prolific and you can't really stop them from producing. Uh, climbing beans of some sort, usually runner beans, so they're always a great one. And salad leaves, cut and come again salad leaves, because they can grow in a pot and they just keep on coming. So things that are bound not to disappoint, uh, not very sort of common to get um, you know, pest and disease attacks, and that just kind of are reliable. So those are my three recommendations but yeah definitely definitely start small and that way you'll feel in control uh, you'll build up your confidence and then you'll be kind of like really excited by it to kind of expand further thanks to benedict for sharing his expertise go and check out growveg.com if you want more tips on growing veggies thanks to you as always for listening don't forget the special offer for listeners over at natural grower they're offering 15 percent off all their range go to naturalgrower.co.uk and enter Roots15 on checkout. Here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a bug you're bound to encounter on your own plot. One of the most common insects to see in a garden is the ant, a member of the insect order called Hymenoptera, which includes the bees and the wasps. Ants are social insects, living within highly organised colonies that build nests, usually underground, and are governed by a queen. Her life within the colony is strictly defined, with each ant having a specific role to play, whether it's scouting and foraging for food, maintaining and defending the nest, or tending to the egg-laying queen and her hundreds of dependent larvae. In Britain, there's over 50 different species of ant, although the most common is the black garden ant, which is often found nesting under paving slabs or around the edge of a lawn but it's also known to invade our homes, particularly when a sugary food source has been discovered by the colony's scouts. Black ants particularly favour sugary substances, and hence the reason they're often seen collecting honeydew from aphids on the garden plants. But in addition, they also need protein, which they get by eating small flies and other insects. Unlike red ants, these black ants don't sting, but they do fiercely defend their nests by biting and squirting formic acid when they're under attack. They also have a strategy to deal with persistent attacks, which is simply to pick up all the eggs and juveniles and move them away to a new location. And that's useful for us to know, because where a colony has become a problem in the garden, it can simply and harmlessly be encouraged to leave by regularly prodding the nest with a garden fork for a few days. And for colonies that can't easily be accessed, pungent smelling plants or certain essential oils placed nearby to the nest have been shown to have a similar effect. Remarkably, an ant colony can remain active for many years. And for the black garden ant, 
that can be around 15 to 20, for as long as the founder queen remains alive. And each year, the colony undertakes its primary mission, which is to create a new generation of reproductive ants, a process managed by the queen, who, at certain times during the year, will lay unfertilised eggs, which go on to develop into males. She'll also allocate some of her fertilised eggs for special treatment, where the resulting larvae are fed a different diet that transforms them from the sterile worker ants into new virgin queens. And when these new reproductive ants eventually mature, they'll have wings, and they'll wait patiently within their nests for a certain set of weather conditions to arrive. Then, when the temperature, humidity and wind speed are just right, they'll flood out of their nests and take to the air in their thousands. Known as the nuptial flight, the males and the new queen black ants from many different nests will swarm together to mate in the sky before those that survive an onslaught from hungry predators such as swallows and swifts will return to the ground where the males will soon die. The mated queens will then discard their wings before wandering away to find somewhere suitable to start and to rule over their own little ant empires. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.